um, I want to introduce our dinner speaker tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Leanne Howe. And I'm very grateful to Phil Deloria, who suggested that we contact Dean Rader at the University of San Francisco to be a part of our project. And Dean, in turn, recommended that we contact Leanne Howe to be part of our project. So it's through Phil that we found Leanne, and I am really grateful. Thank you, Phil. He's good. Um, Leanne is the Eidson Distinguished Professor of American Literature in the English Department at the University of Georgia. She's the author of novels, plays, poetry, screenplays, and scholarship that deal with Native experiences. She's an enrolled citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Her first novel, uh, Shell Shaker, received an American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation. 2000, um, let's see, Before Columbus Foundation, yes. Her book, um, Evidence of Red, Poetry, won the Oklahoma Book Award in 2006. And Chalk Talking on Other Realities is a memoir that I loved reading and won the 2014 MLA Prize for Studies in Native American Literature, Cultures, and Languages. And Leanne will be, uh, she has been awarded a Distinguished Achievement Award for Creative and Critical Work from the Western Literature Association in October of last year. And other awards include a Fulbright Scholarship, uh, 2010 through 11, a 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Native Writers Circle of the Americas and a 2012 United States Artists Ford Fellowship. And tonight, for us, she's going to be doing a performance reading of her new book, Savage Conversations. Leanne. I'm really honored to be here. I want to thank the people whose land this is. I want to thank Marion Wardle and especially uh, the colleagues at MOA, the Red Center of Western uh, Studies, for inviting me here. Uh, it's been great to be in Utah. Uh, these past few days. And I also wanted to say, you know, we were really fortunate at having music at the end of the day that kind of cheered us all up and got us our feet tapping. So that was a wonderful experience for, for all of us as well, and, and certainly me. And I'm, I'm also so excited to see my friend uh, Phil Deloria. And he is also very integral into um, uh, Miko King's, a, a novel I wrote about Indian baseball. He was uh, researching at the Library of Congress and found his last game and, and contacted me about this film, which became an integral storyline integrated into the novel of uh, Basin Ball and set in Indian territory in 1907 and in the present, so uh, I'm really grateful to him for passing that along to me. And so, thank you again. I want to publicly say thank you. Uh, we're constantly in circles of our friends, I think, and people who we admire and um, that enter our lives through the work we do in the academy. And uh, that's certainly been my experience. And I... Um, uh, was also grateful to be able to pass along his last game um, to Marion, and it became part of the Branding the West, Branding the American West uh, exhibition. So that was such a nice threading of different people and elements together. And um, so this evening I do want to talk about uh, the iconic West that really begins in the East before and during and after Lincoln's administration. In Branding the West, the exhibit the book tries to bring together perspectives of the romance of the Western painters and filmmakers whose images of wild savage Indians remain with us today. The Revenant is a good example of this circular imagery that continues to repeat and exposes 
exposes the stereotypes again and again in different ways to our children and native children. Um, so just in considering savage conversations, you know, um, right before Lincoln took office, well, a couple of years, 1858, uh, Colonel George Wright slaughtered 8,000 Palooza horses in September 8th, 1858. The uh, Bear River Massacre in Washington Territory, 1863, during Lincoln's administration, in which a Shoshone camp was attacked by Colonel Patrick Edwin, Edward O'Connor um, and his militia from Salt Lake City, Utah. The Bear River camp was in Washington Territory and not um, they wasted 50, 55,000 bullets um, on a camp of 300. A two-year-old survivor, son of Chief, Chief Sadwich, um, had seven bullets passed through his body, um, and he survived. Uh, Nits make lice, Colonel Shivington, the, the Methodist minister, and Grand Mason led 700-man force uh, during the massacre at Sand Creek. So that was also during Lincoln's administration. Um, even though the Joint Committee on the Conduct of War did an investigation, used a strong language against Chivington and his men, uh, there were never any charges brought against them. So when I look at the beginnings of the West, I look east because that's where the clearing of natives really comes boiling out of the East and into the West, and something that we're interrogating through um, branding the American West. So I'm gonna read to you a little bit of Savage Conversations. This evening, I, I was telling Jane Hafen, a colleague of mine and dear friend for nearly 20 years, um, that, um, I just finished this book like last week, and so I've been working really hard, so I'm really exuberant about it, so um, you have to shut me up at some point. Um, so, I begin. President Abraham Lincoln gave the order to execute 38 Dakota Indians in Mankato, Minnesota for their actions in the Dakota War against white settlers who had first stolen their lands and then their rations and raped their women. At 10 a.m. on December 26, 1862, the synchronized hanging of 38 Dakotas was and continues to be the largest mass execution in the United States history. 4,000 settlers attended the execution. After the mass burial, their bodies were dug up by a local doctor and used as medical cadavers. Fast forward 11 years to November 1873. Dr. Willis Danforth of Illinois treats Mary Todd Lincoln for nervous derangement and fever in the head. He notes peculiar symptoms. Mrs. Lincoln tells him that someone is removing the wires in her eyes, especially the left one, and the bones from her cheek. She attributed the fiendish work inside her head to an Indian spirit. Nightly, she claims, he lifts my scalp and replaces it by dawn, sometimes cutting a bone out of the cheek. The Indian, she says, slits my eyelids, sews them open, always removing the wires by dawn's first light." End quote. In May 1875, Mary Todd Lincoln goes on trial in Chicago for insanity. Judge Marion Wallace presided. Mary's only surviving son, Robert Lincoln, testified against her. The jury deliberated for just 10 minutes before bringing in a verdict. They recommended she be placed in an asylum. Robert Lincoln escorts Mary Todd Lincoln to Bellevue Place Sanitarium on Jefferson Street in Bactavia, Illinois. Once there, she's ensconced in a private residence of the home at Bellevue Place. Mary Todd Lincoln continues to blame an American Indian for her maladies, claiming a savage Indian is torturing her. And I believe her. Apocrypha. 
June 1875, Bellevue Place Sanitarium, 333 South Jefferson Street, Octavia, Illinois. Mary Todd Lincoln's room at, rooms at Bellevue Place. Although there is only a small bed and a bureau in her bedroom, Mary believes her residence sprawl over three sitting rooms, one containing a piano. Her residence is chalk full of trunks, six carpet bags filled with footstools, silk curtains, jewelry, 15 pairs of kit gloves, and a few hidden vials of laudlin hidden among her things. Savage Indian sits in a dark corner of the room. He wears a black vigilante town coat, the one he was hanged in. The coat droops open because the hangman's wife cut off the buttons to, to use on a new frock. Mary Todd Lincoln, before you can think, you forget, and then remember, a dress of blood, gloves are refused to wash, ever. What is it to a wild Indian? The president is shot. Fool, I was his all in all, his Molly, his child wife and mother, his puss, everything. Savage Indian. He called me Puss, too. Catafalque, June 1875, Bellevue Place Sanitarium. Midnight, a single candle lights Mary's bedroom. She wears an off-white tattered nightdress. The underarms are soiled and smell vulgar. Her small feet are swollen. The skin is paper thin. Savage Indian has a small box on his lap filled with her jewelry. He fingers each pit piece and finally fastens a pearl necklace around his neck. Mary Todd Lincoln holds a mirror to her round face. Nightly, I examine the ruined heads in my handheld mirror, yours and mine. Our eyes dangle like dull grapes on a broken vine. Is it the candlelight? Savage Indian watches her with menacing eyes but does not move. Mary Todd Lincoln. I touch the blemish on your face, finger your blood-stained shirt. A drop of spittle has escaped from your tight lips. Your bare clammy feet, clammy as fish, all there and here. I kiss the mirror, beg you to wake, fight to catch your attention through some mad theatrical gesture. Remember? My bed, always a catafalque to you. Oh, let, let fly my flesh, hair, and eyelash. Pay the night jars who regularly serenade, but like us, steal the milk of goats. Here at last, I'll tell it all. I did wish you dead, sir, 8,039 times for all the days you ran sideways from our home, whistling a night jar's tune. Pay them all now, sir, before dawn's light. Savage Indian reads aloud the inscription on her wedding ring. Love is eternal. Catafalque 2, June 1875, Bellevue Place Sanitarium. Mary Todd Lincoln, arriving nightly without invitation, you make my room a ceremony as night jars sing, wing clap, chur a bird's song, inhibited at dawn by God's will, like us. When shall I tell them the truth? Where shall I keep the truth? Under my frayed petticoat, it will not flower now. There is no need to wait for tea. I confess, I did long for the pleasure of your coarse skin. Money to spin, kit gloves, chiffon and satin, ball gowns properly hemmed, doomed children. Tonight, let us hoist the catafalque over a new grave. Hold my hands above the dank earth as the night jar serenade. Oh, what a great heart smasher you are, Mr. Lincoln. Adieu, my confessor, my all in all, lover, protector, ghost, husband. Wishing for nothing, not even breath, 
take the flint knight. Cut me, I dare you. Savage Indian Feeds Gar Woman, June 1875, Bellevue Place Sanatorium. 3 a.m., a slight breeze blows, the gauzy curtains open, moonlight floods the room. Mary Todd Lincoln, cleave unto me, seduce, fetter, handcuff, wheel clamp the irons. Savage, I cease all protestations. Savage Indian checks her scalp for knits, wipes excess bear grease from his hands on her nightdress, fills her gaping mouth with fescue and sod. How does it taste, Gar Woman? If they are hungry, let them eat grass or their own dung. Trader Andrew Merrick's words, Lower Sioux Agency, 18, August 15th, 1862, your sentiment repeated many times. Mary Todd Lincoln swallows. May 9th, 1875, I am in possession only of my name, Mary Todd Lincoln, bewildered with a joy so noble, I too could expire. Savage Indian, who says Abe is dead. Long Night's Moon, June 1875, Bellevue Place Sanatorium. 4 a.m., Mary Todd Lincoln's rooms, many candles light the atmosphere. The air is hot and stifling. Savage Indian with a long rope, he shackles her legs to the chair for the 57th time tonight. Gar Woman, that is your true name. Gar feed at night sometimes eat their own eggs. We were all once fish. The scent of a woman during copulation reminds us. Mary Todd Lincoln, vulgarity at last, just like my Mr. L. He once asked me why a woman was like a barrel. Savage Indian shrugs. Mary Todd Lincoln giggles. You have to raise the hoops before you put the head in. Savage Indian breathes deeply through his nose, snorts out the bad air, leaves her side and walks around her bedroom. Mary Todd Lincoln, fiend, he was my lover, father and comedian. Savage Indian snuffles and pinches her things. The knit, com the knit comb on her bureau intrigues him the most. Fishy in here. Mary Todd Lincoln smooths the wrinkles of her sour nightdress, the one she's worn since March 12, 1875. Ghoul, specter, poltergeist, banshee, you are the fishy one. Savage, be gone from my head. Savage Indian, quiet, someone is coming. Mary Todd Lincoln, no doubt the wandering Jew, nightly he steals my pocketbook. Savage Indian, hush, be still. He moves in close, gently caresses her face, takes a sharp flint from his leather pouch, slits the soft skin above each eyelid, eyelid then sews it firmly open with a thread of silver filigree. Mary Todd Lincoln, ecstatic. Oh, at last. I can see the world as it truly is. The rope sees. And that's S-E-E-T-H-E-S. -E -E um, I have such a southern accent sometimes you can't understand what I'm saying. Sees. Now I lay me down, 1875 June, Bellevue Place Sanatorium. Mary sits in a chair in her bedroom. A small candle blooms on the bureau. Mary Todd Lincoln. Tattoos adore his, adorn his arms and hands. Like night-blooming cirrus, they prick the skin, slash my will. The savage says nitpicking takes time and patience, but can be very enjoyable for both parties. 
savage Indian. Tonight, he does not bind her arms and legs with a rope, but combs her oily hair. Immerse and emit any nits and lice in kerosene water. Pull them from the hair, drop them in a bowl. Pin clean sections of the hair aside. Scissor divide segments close to the scalp. Wait. Mary Todd Lincoln. These many days after Abraham, I have come to this, hairless, with a deformed cheek. Those of us with eyes sewn open perceive nothing to fear. Not gunpowder, walls of fire, a wild Dakota Indian, the presidential box at Ford's Theater, a hangman's noose. Savage Indian. Silence, Gar Woman. Ever so gently, he takes the sharp flint from the leather pouch. They assent to the nightly ritual, the one she craves. Mary Todd Lincoln picks up the mirror, studies her face, her thin upper lip curling into a smile. I faint from the ecstasy. The rope Seethe. The rope speaks July 4th, 1875, Bellevue Place Sanitarium. A single noose hangs from the ceiling in Mary Todd Lincoln's formal sitting room. Savage Indian listens and holds a flint knife in his hand. Rope. I done it. I done them all. I come when I'm called, like a dog, a horse, a lover. This is how I make brothers and sisters. Rope begins to fashion a second noose with his hands. Start with this piece of string or rope three feet in length. Bring one end of the loop down parallel to the original rope and fold it into thirds. It should form a wide sideways S. The lead should be left and longer, so you have some string left at the end for tying something to it. With the bottom of the original C, wrap the end of the rope around the loop several times from the bottom near your hand upwards. With the rope that has been wound around the C, poke the end through the top of the loop left by the S. Once the loop is fully tightened, the task is complete. Rope laughs, holds the noose up for inspection, hangs it from a rafter in Mary's bedroom. A good noose should have one giant loop at one end, a piece of rope at the other. Mary Todd Lincoln and Savage Indian rem admire the rope. The rope seethes, two down, 36 more to go. Savage Indian Laments, July 4th, 1875. Bellevue Place Sanitarium, Octavia, Illinois. Savage Indian walks amidst all the clutter and circles the room. Mary Todd Lincoln sits in a ladder back chair. Her legs are bound. Periodically, she covers her ears. Savage Indian. I know isolation. Silence. The slow descent downward. Lost somewhere in midair. Gar woman, I have crippling doubts, but I surrender nothing, not even in death. He pauses and looks around the room. I no longer have to worry. That doesn't mean I am not suspicious of the living. They enter my dreams uninvited. In Dakota land, they are pulling down the last of our dead, bodies of men and women hanged by a rope of lies. When I was human, I would sing the air thick with Dakota songs. December 26th. 
1862. In 150 years, the citizens of Mankato will shiver, asking why their ancestors hanged 38 Dakota Indians over a handful of hen's eggs. When I look at the world, it fills your rooms. Because in the end, even your life is a reservation. Maybe all are reservations, captivity accounts. He drinks water from a china teacup for the 38 lives abandoned. In that moment in Mankato, I was misplaced. Maybe the night jars carried my spirit to safety, back to the beginning. Maybe before Mother Earth existed, you're probably wondering when, what millennia. Because in your eyes, every hour is measured. Savage Indian drinks from another china teacup as if making a toast. To die alone while dying with 37. This is where I tell you about my friends dying. A death song. He sang it. Then we sang it together on the platform in Mankato. We tried to grasp pans, shouting to the winds, Minnesota, Makochi, the land where the waters reflect the sky, the land where we die. The words caught in our throats, choked by a muscular rope. Savage Indian points with his lips to the ceiling. Rope, he held fast. Rope shimmies down from the ceiling, takes a bow. 1862, almost like a birthday. Tiny needles show, so shut the burlap around our faces. Buried in a mass grave, only to be dug up. Stolen by physicians to be used as medical cadavers later stored in iron pots. Still, our bodies cramped and squirmed in the wind, our spirits scattered. All of us, Gar woman, still hang, and you, dressed in your night shift, the one you refuse to remove all these weeks, can never cover the past. The soldiers are pulling on their boots. They are not the ones they think they are. When I am myself, as I am tonight, every word is a weapon. When I am myself, as I am tonight, why can't I forget what happened and just take you amid the dried up tingling in my head, the dried up prickle between my legs, the ragged filaments of desire? Oh, I, I lied to the soldiers, but Gar woman, you are not who you claim to be. You bring a child into the world and intensely regret it, despite your theatrical tears for pity. And you believe you know what must be done with your deadly bruise and tainted teas. I have seen the ghosts of your relations shrink when you enter a room, Abraham, Eddie, Willie, even Tad, shadows escaping your fiery sun. What happens next, Gar Woman? You've swallowed your eggs because the wind refuses your touch, because the insects abandon the ground where you sleep, because your prayers wilt the prairie grasses, because at dawn every breath is a trial, because with your eyes sewn open you still see nothing, because everything you touch leaves a bruise. The muskets are being reloaded, the carbines are being reloaded. The large bore rifles are being reloaded. The Gatlin guns are being reloaded. Emancipate me. Fire! The rope seethes. And now, a bloody tongue unspools. Thank you.
thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, to bring this right down to the ground. Uh, yeah, um, about the work, how it relates to the West, maybe not, but maybe. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so the subject of the execution at Mankato uh, was the subject of a This American Life uh, podcast. I just did a podcast anyway. Uh, and it's, I teach here at BYU, and I have my students listen to that. And the thing that was so striking about uh, the story is how many of the people in that area had never heard of that story. It really got forgotten. Um, and. So I'm wondering uh, if, you know, if part of what you see as your work is to uh, tell the stories that otherwise might be forgotten uh, and uh, give, give voice to those whose voices were silenced in that way. That's part of it. Yeah, I, but I also was, when I started to do the research on, um, uh, I was at the University of Illinois and so Illinois is really um, the land of Lincoln. And I started doing a little bit, a little bit of research on uh, the Lincolns and Mary Todd Lincoln's insanity file, in which all everything in there is from uh, the, the historic record, actually. Um, the, the eyes slid open. All of that comes right out of her voice. Um, what I was most taken with, and what I, why I wrote this, is that like Susan Smith, who blamed a black man for killing her children when in fact she'd driven them into the water, I got very um, exercised by the fact that Mary Todd Lincoln blamed her insanity on an American Indian. And that really um, kind of floored me and at the same time, I've asked historians, everybody knows this who works on the Lincolns. Everybody knows this who works on the Lincolns. And they know what she said. They know part of the file. Why have they ignored the part about her blaming an American Indian? And that kind of blind, blind adherence to do, well, she was crazy. I just didn't want to pay any attention to it. I didn't think it was relevant. I didn't think it was relevant is exactly the same kind of work that brown, branding the American West is, a, is hoping to do, is to open up a possible space for um, a, a deeper interrogation of what that means, and deeper interrogation about the Lincoln presidency. I read to you, think his presidency is very messy, and no one has looked at, oh, well, he, he really helped uh, uh, end slavery. Yes, he did. At the same time, he was clearing the West of American Indians. So there's a lot of mess there. And so that's why I got interested in the story is that, oh, it's got to be an American Indian's fault. After you hanged the Dakotas in the largest mass execution, you're going to blame an Indian further for your own <sighs> insanity. And so that, that, that in itself, uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, historians who've worked on the Lincolns and they all say, well, it just didn't seem like it was relevant. So I thought it was. And by the way, I wanted to believe her. I wanted to believe her. So what does that make me? It makes me kind of ghoulish too. And so, uh, yeah. So any, any other thoughts? Yes. Thoughts, not necessarily a question, man, but the whole time I was listening to that paper this afternoon about lynching in Wyoming, I was thinking about Chittington, and I was also thinking about Mankato, and I was thinking of the horrifying um, denial of humanity all over this history of the West, and that these are, you know, things that get sublimated. Um, but the other thing that I was thinking of as you were reading is the other mystery that I've encountered in the late 19th century of how many spiritualists. Uh, spirit guides are American Indians, and then American Indians just turn up all over this literature as the people who create the, the passageway between our world and the other world. And it makes me think of a little bit also of Cynthia Robinson's work on haunting and the Hudson, and 
slavery and massacres in that area as well, and how much these, these reappearances um, coming up in these other dimensions um, really do need to be interrogated. So I'm just really grateful that you're doing this and thinking about why we must be haunted by the massacres that we refuse to actually face head on and perhaps deal with. Yeah, thank you. That's certainly better articulated than, than I did. <laughs> but um, absolutely, I do think this is a space of, of uh, at least for me, it's a space in which I wanted to work. And um, it, it, uh, <clears throat> it, it's been a, a really in interesting journey for me uh, to go on that journey with the two of them in these confined quarters. What happened? Um, and I'm pretty convinced by the, the scholarship that she leaves, that they, she doesn't, that, that the, the uh, American Indian goes with her when she leaves the sanitarium. She, she doesn't become a different person and doesn't get healed and isn't well. And um, yeah, so that, that I think continues. Certainly it continued with her, yeah. So any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I think that his, his administration, we could call it the administration, administrative genocide. Um, when you look at what, what is happening out west, but also there's a civil war and there's, a, there's mass murder occurring everywhere, and we, we all talk about it in a, in a, in a fairly deodorized way. Uh, 20,000 dead here from this... Uh, battle um, in one day, you know, and so it, I think it has, I think that we have a lot of work to do in, in looking at, at what these things are around the Lincolns. And certainly I've begun to, I've begun to think that Mary Todd Lincoln was the stronger, uh, more willful of the two of them. And, um, I think she's undercut a lot by the fact that if he hadn't been assassinated, we'd have much more deeper interrogations of what was going on inside the family as well. That's, that's, just, um, that's just what I think. You know, I'm not sure. But um, certainly I wanted to do that. And, uh, but it is, uh, it, Illinois is a space of, of the West and what is happening um, and it's an opening. It's a, it's a good opening for us. Okay, you've been a lovely audience. Thank you so much.